My guest today is Andrew Craddock. If the age of Agile can be said to have started with the publication of the Agile Manifesto back in February 2001, Andrew has seen it all. He's been deeply involved in Agile development since the beginning. Trained and assessed by the co-creator of Scrum, Ken Schraber, he was one of the first cohort of Scrum Masters in the UK. Andrew is the co-author of the internationally recognised Agile PM framework for Agile project management, which is probably the world's global standard. He's an enthusiastic member of the leadership team of the Agile Business Consortium and has played a key role for the last 20 years in various positions within the consortium and at various times chair. His professional passion, though, is to take Agile beyond its roots in IT into the wider context of business agility. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much. So, Andrew, how does the Agile Business Consortium define business agility? Is there an easy explanation? Is there an easy definition? Well, interestingly enough, we've... We actually had uh, a, a couple of workshops very recently to try and crystallise a definition. Um, we found that most people in the uh, in the consortium had their own idea of what it was, and it was pretty similar in most cases. But we hadn't actually crystallised it into a uh, into a formal definition. So, uh, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and look at my notes because it's, <laughs> it's very fresh and I haven't committed it to memory yet. Well, I think it's been a workshop, and this is the de- and this is the prescribed wisdom. I think it's right that we get it right. <laughs> yeah. So it's a people centred, organisation wide capability uh, that enables value delivery to a world characterised by increasing volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity by inspiring and harnessing collaborative, creative uh, ways of working. So uh, it, it is just under 50 words, or it should be. <laughs> that, that is a, that's a high mark to live up to. Yeah, yeah, in, indeed. And it, it really sort of uh, focuses on two things. One one of which is important is important increasingly important to businesses, which is this ability to thrive and survive by being able to adapt quickly and decisively to changes in in the business environment. Um, and the other element brings in the collaborative, creative ways of working, the people centered part. Um, the you know the notion that uh, you're much better to have multiple brains applied to any problem rather than expect one brain at the top to be uh, to be doing everything and just telling others what to do. It's interesting, but haven't truly successful businesses always been agile to a certain degree? I'm not sure that's true. Actually, I think uh, I think that's it is true of smaller businesses most certainly, but the uh, what we've seen you know, over the last I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years has been uh, this bigger fish eating smaller fish, you know, the the idea of the economies of scale and, and that sort of thing, bigger and bigger organisations. Um, and you only have to look at the impact of the pandemic in the last couple of years to see how quite often it's those bigger chains of uh, of retail shops, for example, that are the ones that have gone under. They haven't been able to adapt. They haven't been able to be creative enough and to roll out, if they have been creative, to roll that creativity out across their their organisation. Whereas you look at your sort of mum and dad corner shops those are the ones that have survived Interesting. Um, because perhaps two things. One is there are less people to get involved in the change to be, to adapt. So that's a, that's a good thing. A fewer people there are, it's, it's, you know, a small fish turning rather than a big tanker turning. Uh, and the other one perhaps is about the passion and commitment to that. So people are going to be more passionate, committed, engaged, with their own business than they are perhaps with, you know, as part of a 700,000 other people in that business. So I think that sort of, that mindset is what, uh, what's really important and, and culturally trying to harness that is important. So you look at some big organizations, um, where they are hidebound probably is worth saying with, with, 
with pro procedures and things like that. So you have a whole load of procedures. You treat you treat the employees who are in call centers or wherever it might be as drones reading a script. You know, you're not providing the ability for them to think and respond to what they're hearing on the other end of a telephone or from a customer. Um, and you get this sort of computer says no sort of mm. sort of mentality, even if those words aren't used to you as, as a customer on the end of a phone to a big bank or something like that. You certainly feel that there's, uh, there's, there's something going wrong. That, that, that's very interesting. So is it fair to say then that that agility is more an attitude, uh, a behavior, rather than a set of processes? So it's more about the individual being willing to be agile rather than the organization having the prescribed approach to being agile. I think so. It's, it's, it's certainly more about that. Um, I think there is still a need for processes but in in an agile environment those processes tend to be much lighter they tend to frame and guide people rather than uh, rather than sort of lead them by the nose down a down a very narrow path mm. so i know agile's been around in project management probably for the last 20 years or so i think you know i think when you wrote the agile project management guide together with others it was probably about 12 15 years ago why is agile really only now moving into the wider business area or have i misunderstood that you know is agile really focused in projects and struggling to get into other parts of the business or are you seeing it already in other parts of the business so again that's a that's another really interesting question and i think it brings together two things to be honest it brings together um the fact that the world is becoming increasingly volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous um and that has had only only more recently has had an impact on businesses as a whole perhaps um with the onset of the sort of uh, the digital era as well certainly in terms of projects involving it the realization that it was all virtual. It was really easy to change something, you know, tweak a line of code and you could change the behavior of a, of a system uh, that easily. That sort of flexibility and versatility within technology uh, really sort of caught on and people realizing that uh, realizing that actually we can change our mind here. We can, we've spotted this change. We can adapt what we're asking for to achieve that, um, was actually what led to the problems with the more traditional way of running projects. So the traditional way of running projects, um, basically relied on a, a predictive process mm -hmm. based on an assumption that the problem you're trying to solve is going to be stable. And the environment in which you're solving it is going to be stable. In, indeed. Um, and the back in the, I don't know, let's say the, the sort of 1970s, go back to the 1970s and, and the, the dawn of IT, really. Um, yes, the world was changing. The world, world has always changed over, over, its, uh, over, over history. Um, but that pace of change has, has been growing uh, I don't know whether it's exponential, but it must be close to that, you know, uh, uh, since that time at least. Um, and in the world of projects, which is a smaller world, it's e easier to be buffeted, if you like, um, in terms of change. And people with the right entrepreneurial motivations actually saying, if we make this change, we can serve a customer better. Mm -hmm. So the motivations were there, um, and they conflicted with this idea of a stable problem domain, right? So, so we ended up in a position where, you know, the dawn of IT really challenged traditional projects and the, the creation of software, which had been likened to, you know, building a bridge or something, um, in the early days 
realised it was completely different actually to building a bridge. You know, if you're building a bridge, you don't suddenly say actually rather than rather than landing at that point on the other river bank, we want to lie, we want to land a hundred yards up or hundred meters up uh, up the bank. Or actually, you know what? Instead of carrying people across this bridge, we'd like to put a train across it. You know, those sorts of things um, almost impossible to adapt quickly in a uh, engineering construct mm. but much easier to do in software you know in, in reality so getting back to to your question of why is it only recently sort of becoming of interest in uh, in businesses as a whole i think stems from the fact that the the storm of change has grown and grown and grown and is now buffeting whole organizations rather than just bits of organizations. Um, and, and that is why uh, I think organizations are looking to, to be able to ra react um, more in a more agile way within their environment to maintain their competitive advantage. That, that's quite interesting. So do you think that that's the the death knoll of the three to five year business plan. Do you think the business plans are now going to evolve into something that is aspirational, <clears throat> but we're going to change the way we work. We're going to be much more adaptive. We're going to be much more flexible in terms of what we do. And are you seeing any of that evidence among the members of the corp consortium? Are you sort of hearing that from the organizations that you talk to? I haven't I haven't actually spoken to 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 sort of people in organizations uh recently uh to to understand it I uh, as well as being involved with the uh with the consortium I also uh run my own consultancy business and in that business I've worked with uh, with a number of clients over the last decade um where I've just observed the process they go through their strategy process their five year plan idea um as Futile, to be perfectly honest. You know, you, you cannot know where the world is going to be in five years' time. You know, you just can't know. And the, as is the same with projects moving to an agile way of working, uh, if you've got a project that's going to take a, I don't know, take a year, for example, so uh, can you be sure what the state of the world is going to be in a year's time? You know, and, and the answer is no. And one of the reasons, therefore, that you adopt an agile approach is to, to say, OK, well, we know what it is we want to achieve. We know the big picture of our ambition. And I think, therefore, I like that phrase that you used in terms of strategy. Uh, yes, a, an organization can have an ambition to achieve something over a five year period. Brilliant. Um, but the idea that you can plan this out in a regimented way over five years, um, given that by the time you get to the end of year one, it's going to be a very different world to the one we're in today, seems a bit of a folly. Um, so we're actually, uh, the consortium's just uh, just uh, embarking on some work around agile strategy. We've got a, uh, um, as, as, as you are probably aware, we have our framework for business agility. Framework for business agility includes as one of the sort of key influencers strategy and needing to uh, to deal with strategy in an agile way. So uh, we've just started some uh, some work on that. It's early days, um, but the key thing is to make the the process of defining your strategy and therefore refining your strategy on an ongoing basis as easy to achieve as possible. So you don't have this idea of a you know, workshops spanning three months uh, that come up with a five-year plan, you actually condense that into a, yeah, we'll have, we'll have a workshop for, for our five-year plan, um, and then we'll, we'll think in more detail what we're going to do in the coming year, um, and then in even more detail what we're planning to do in the next three to six months. You know, and we expect every, every few months maybe, maybe even more often depending on, on – the precise nature of the business that uh, that's doing this strategy uh, to to really sort of understand how the world's changed in the last three six one maybe month um, and uh, and and determine whether the strategic direction is still right. If you've got a broad ambition, the chances are that won't change in the uh, in in a three, six year, two year period. Um, 
but it might, you know. But uh, assuming it doesn't, it's all about how that's achieved, and that's where the, di- the, the sort of dynamic um, uh, aspect is needed to cope with the change in the world in that period of time. That's fascinating, but it does actually throw up some huge challenges, doesn't it, for some big organisations? So if you, if you if you take um, if you take that concept, you know. If you decide that you need to increase your production capability within a market, you know, once you made the decision that you're going to have to build a factory, you know, that's a multi-month project. You know, these days with modularization, it could be quite quick, and you know, there's not a lot goes into. You could build the the shell of the factory without equipping it, but once you've actually made the decision to build the factory, you are committed to get to a point where there is some value from whatever you've done. So so do you end up with organisations having some multi-month or multi-year activities that are towards their aspiration, but then there's some smaller activities around it that you can flex. So you, know, you could build the factory, but then within the factory, you might change what the product is you're going to build in that factory. Or you might um, partner with somebody else to use the factory for something else, that sort of thing. So, so it really has a not a two speed thought process, but it has a a two time scale thought process about things we've got to commit to, because if we are serious about that aspiration, we're going to need this. But actually, if all thing, if things go wrong, if the market changes significantly, do we have a plan B where we can put it to a different use? Mm. Absolutely, and I, and I think as you as you were as you were sort of um, making your point there, Richard, I, I've, I've I've got something in the back of my mind which was uh, which is a case study I read a long time ago now, but it's I believe it was uh, it was um, Honda and Yamaha uh, in the uh, in the motorcycle business, um, and uh, and I I'm not a bit I'm not a big uh, sort of motorcycle enthusiast uh but one of those one of those players had uh, a real dominance the other one wanted to come into the market and it was assumed that they would go through a long relatively laborious process uh long certainly a long-winded process to build their capability to take on their competitor in a significant way what, they, what the competitor did, what the newcomer to the market did, though, was actually have a strategy of disruption. So they went into this rather than saying, right, we can compete in an equal way on equal grounds. They had, they had the notion of disrupting the market, introducing new things. And I think they turned the wisdom, if I remember rightly, they turned the wisdom of manufacturing almost on its head. So whereas their competitor had three or four or whatever it was, um, models of motorcycle they came into the market and they were releasing half a dozen motorcycles a year you know so so the idea of um you know sort of big regimented production line type thinking was disrupted by the we might only build a hundred thousand of these then we'll move on to the next one Hmm. and that sort of disruption was uh, was what allowed them to uh, to to succeed and compete in in that market so i think the i think the trick is to to blend those things as you say you know the lead time to build a factory is going to be the lead time to build a factory uh, and the investment needed will be the inve- will be that investment uh, but what you do with it and how you bring it online and things like that and you know what can you do to deliver value early in that process is i think the needs to be the focus of uh, of strategy that gives you that ability to to um to to shift and uh, and and i at least respond to the market but hopefully lead it and in- introduce disruption and make it the challenge of the incumbent players to have to adapt to the uh, to the disruption that uh, that you're causing that's interesting. I mean, I've always thought of marketing being pretty agile because, you know, you, you can start a campaign, you can change the campaign as you go through it. But, yeah, agile HR, do you see, I mean, do you have any thoughts on whether it is possi- possible to be agile in HR? So that, that, 
that's quite interesting. I think the the some of the processes within within HR, for example, around recruitment tend to be quite dynamic. Mm. Yep. So res- responsive. We've got we've got a, a role here needs filling. We need it filled. You know, it's not a case of oh right, well we'll get somebody in in two years time. <laughs> it has to be has to be filled in short order. Um, however, other processes around around HR um, tend to be quite cumbersome. They tend to have actually quite dubious value. Um, so, like the annual appraisal, like the annual appraisal, for example, you know, and uh, and you know, witnessing companies. So <laughs> these are companies that uh, that I have uh, in the past done some sort of degree of business with. Hearing about some of the behaviours in their 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 HR review annual review policies, um, where, for example, um, we're trying to promote agility within the organisation. Part of that says it doesn't matter what your your specialist skill set is. It's about mucking in with the team as a whole to deliver value and to deliver value as efficiently as possible. And you know what? I'd rather you came and helped out. I don't know. You're a um, a business analyst, for example. I'd rather you came out and helped with some testing than sit there twiddling your thumbs waiting for the next thing to analyze. Mm. Right. So. Uh, we sort of instilled that sort of philosophy within within a team. The team was delivering very well. Um, in this case, it was a business analyst went for uh, for their appraisal, and they were marked down for doing things that were beyond their role. Hmm. You know, and you look at that and think, what planet is <laughs> is somebody this HR person who's running this appraisal on? If they would put you are not conforming to your job specification above delivering value to a customer. It's really quite strange. So I think, you know, agility in HR that is focused around um, inspiring and 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 enabling and promoting agility within the individuals, within the, the humans they are resource managing, <laughs> um, makes a hell of a lot of sense. So yes, change is needed. Uh, within HR to uh, to allow that to happen. That's a fascinating story because I can remember I worked for a consulting engineers many years ago when you still had draftsmen and you had drawing boards. And there were two draftsmen in a department and one of them would do anything to help the engineers. So much so that you know they would go and get lunch, they'd make tea, those sorts of things. And they were a highly valued member of the team. The other one was a job's worth and it was, I don't start till nine o'clock and I finish at 5.30 and I only draw, I don't do anything else. And when they had to look at um, reducing the team size, because the person that went was the person that did all, helped everybody else. And the person remained was a draft. And the productivity and the morale within the team went through the floor. So, you know, long time ago, maybe an early example of, that agility within the team is about how do you make the team more successful rather than how do you just do what you're there for. Absolutely Fascinating, right. yeah. I can understand that that example of agility within, say, HR, about making everything more relevant and more valuable to the organisation. But you know, what is the, what's the consortium's role? What, what role are you playing in this whole movement towards business agility? Yeah, how have you set your stall out for the aspiration or long term? And you know, how is the stall looking in the short to medium term? That's another really good question. And one of the things we we did as a, a board of directors a number of years ago, we uh, you you mentioned right at the beginning um, agile project management and and that sort of thing. That was really what the agile business consortium or the DSDM consortium, as it was called back then did we were about methods we were about our own brand of method um and uh, yeah the the consortium was formed by uh, a, a group of of quite big companies um back in the late 90s um who were struggling with um it based projects you know that were running over budget uh, over time not satisfying the business need and, and all of that. Um, 
it has changed. <laughs> but what's really interesting, though, we're talking about the sort of dynamic nature of the world. The world has got a hell of a lot more dy dynamic. So sometimes now you look at it and think nothing has changed. If things genuinely hadn't changed, <laughs> then we'd be in a real problem right now. Um, but that's what the consortium did. And uh, uh, back in uh, 2016, um, 2017, around then, we started looking at um, diversifying away from that and thinking, you know, the wisdom that is built into agility in projects and agility in product development um, has a place in the wider world of business. Um, and, and that actually got got us thinking about how we could achieve that. I actually was, uh, went through a, a pretty tough patch myself uh, back then. And I was getting, I've been working with organizations trying to, to, to help them uh, become more productive and responsive, more agile. And we're finding that I was working with projects and project teams and that sort of thing, doing lots of, of, uh, of things with them, allowing them and, and helping them become more agile, only to find we kept hitting a brick wall. Um, and that brick wall was around corporate processes. Mm. Um, and the corporate processes were stifling the agility within those teams. And I, I came off the back of, of one particularly pointless engagement with a client um, who genuinely didn't understand what agility was. They thought it was some way of cracking a whip in a special way that allowed people to do things quicker and better, you know, which, which it isn't. And I actually thought, I've had enough of this. I genuinely thought, I've had enough of this. I think I might just jack this in and go and drive a bus, you know, and I, I, that was honestly was going through my mind and it was um at that exactly that point that uh that we realized as the agile uh, as the agile business consortium we could take this agility wider in the world and i thought well you know what if we can do that if we can really bring the message and the wisdom of agility to the management of an organization to the boardroom of an organization then that will start bringing down those barriers. So rather than, rather than sort of hitting your head against a wall, um, you might still have a fight, you might still have a struggle, but at the very least, if, if top down agility is understood and bottom up agility is being practiced <laughs> genuinely, then it could sustain significant change. So that's what really led to the thinking, uh, around this. And, uh, it led from there to um, to the creation of our framework for business agility. Sounds like a fabulous endeavor. It wasn't because the framework for business agility is incredibly light. Um, it really just defines areas of focus. So, uh, so, and those areas of areas of focus include things like culture, leadership, strategy, governance. So all of those things which were getting in the way of teams being agile, we're saying we need agility in those things in order to allow agility at the coalface. Andrew, fascinating talking to you. Many thanks for finding time for this podcast. I'm sure things are very, very busy at the moment with everything that's going on within the consortium. So thank you very much. It's fair to say they've never been busier, but I always love for anything I can do to, uh, to help spread the word. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Richard.